Okay, so what I thought I would do now is um, I, there's if in the beginning, well, like I showed you in the unboxing, there's, um, and we can look at it again here, there's actually um, three scenarios, um, and then there's the grand campaign. And so in the scenario, let's see, can you see that without me destroying my board here? The scenarios are basically this um, scenario one, this El Caney Hill, uh, or I don't know if it's a hill or not, and then there's a scenario two, which is San Juan Hill, and scenario three is just the combination, you combine these two, you play through it. And then beyond that, it, there's just the grand campaign. So what I thought I would do is set up San Juan Hill and um, just show you how the game actually plays. Now, I will say that I have played this scenario uh, once before. And, you know, if you look at the scenario link that says turns one through two, that tells me that this is a two-turn scenario. And the victory conditions for this particular scenario are um, the U.S. must be the last to occupy these um, locations. So this is San Juan Hill back here, Kettle Hill here, and um, these other two locations. So you, the U.S. player needs to control or have, be the last to have controlled a majority of these spaces. So... Um, not, you know, you don't have to have a unit sitting there at the end of the scenario, but certainly you'd want a U.S. force to pass through it. And when they do, you know, I've got it marked green now just to see where they are, but I'll put a blue one down if, if they do that. And I say if <laughs> because, like I said, I, I played through this scenario once, and I do not see how in the world it is even possible in just two turns to um, to do any of that. And I don't know if that's just, if there's an error. This This is the second printing of this game. This game came out in 2007, I believe, and, and this, this edition I have here, uh, this reprint came out at the end of last year. And um, and so I don't know, I've looked at the old rules, and there's not a heck of a lot of difference between the old rules and the new rules in some respects. There are some differences, but um, these scenarios didn't really change, and I was hoping that maybe um, maybe they had... It, it, I just, there's no, and you'll see, because the, the turns go fairly quick, and I, I, I didn't even come close to doing anything to, um, in two turns to taking any of these. There were some bad, uh, <laughs> there were some bad dice rolling. That certainly could have had an effect on it. Um, and so, we'll see. So, anyway, I just wanted to set this one up, and just to show you how it plays, I really think the meat of this game is in the grand campaign. I, I, I think these, these, uh, two or three, um, tutorial scenarios, I'm going to call them. Um, I don't think there was a heck of a lot of thought put into them. I think it's really just for you to get a feel for the mechanics. And I do believe that the grand campaign would is probably the way to go. And um, maybe I'll do that at some point. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so as, as we as we go through this, I'll point out some things I that some errors or some questions I have and um, some, maybe some things I like or don't like about it, if I remember. Um, and I may end up asking some questions on uh, Board Game Geek. Um, at the uh, Splendid Little Warp site page. Um, just try to get some feedback, some questions answered. So, um, and over here, I've got, you probably can see this little thing in the corner down here. This, I, there's no sequence of play there is in the rule book, but there's not a, um, you do get some nice cards as I showed you in the unboxing. You get these heavy, um, these heavy stock cards. So th th those are nice, um, but there's really no sequence of play. So I've, I've got a, uh, a three by five card I just kind of wrote down. Um, sequence of play on, so I'll probably referring to that. Um, and so, uh, like I said, so um, to win as the U.S. side, you must control a majority of these locations. And there was another condition, I think it was um, the survivability of your units. I'll just double check. Yeah, lose no more than five subunits. Um, any other outcome is a Spanish victory. So what is a subunit? Let's look at that real quick. Let's grab, um, let's grab, well, let's start over here. Let's grab Kent. So this is General Kent. Uh, oops, I just shot the uh, Rough Riders across the board. So let's get them back. We'll look at them in a second, actually. Um, so this map is not laying flat, but that's okay. We'll work around it. All right, so um, what is a subunit? And General Kent's going to sit here while I show you this. Um, let's move this out to here. Let's see if that's still showing up. Yeah, so 
Um, so this is the, um, let's see, this is the first division, I believe, or the uh, U.S. player, first infantry division. So this is the first infantry division. And um, so these breakdown units are, this unit can break down either voluntarily or uh, through um, step losses into these sub counters, these subunits. So these these three um, subunits would make up this, uh, this this infantry division. So if they took a hit, you know, and when you take a step loss, it's um, you you lose a unit. So for the the Spanish side, that's bad because they do Spanish units do not break down. They take a hit, they're just going to go away. However, the uh, American side can break down into these smaller units before they um, to uh, to take a step loss. So that's what they mean when they say uh, no more than five subunits lost. And uh, like I said, the Rough Riders, uh, they have a counter, uh, a caval cavalry uh, counter, much like this 1st Infantry Division. Up here, they have General Wheeler and Colonel Roosevelt is there. The scenario says to deploy a uh, cavalry division. Uh, didn't specify the Rough Riders, but, you know, hey, it's San Juan Hill. I... <laughs> I'm assuming they meant it's the Rough Riders. I could have that wrong. I don't know. But it's going to be the Rough Riders in, in this playthrough. Because hey, Teddy Roosevelt in San Juan Hill, how are you not going to have the Rough Riders? So, uh, but yeah, they break down just like this 1st Infantry Division. So let's put them back. That's what the subunits are. And I'm going to have them off to the side over here with near the reinforcements um, so that when we do break those down, uh, we can pull from that pile. So, um, that's the victory conditions. Um, we will mark uh, game turns over here at the bottom of the board. Um, and I, let's, I'm just going to start and go. I don't know how long I'm, I'm going to spend playing through this. Um, we'll see. Maybe I'll play the entire uh, two turns and you'll see what I mean by <laughs> I didn't get very far. Um, so, what I'm going to do is starting with the sequence of play. Um, and the sequence of play I will show you is in the rule book on the third page, sequence of play. Um, and I do have my uh, cheat sheet over here. First thing in the sequence of play is there's a weather phase. Um, we're not going to worry about weather in this small scenario. Weather would not come into play until turn seven, I believe it, if I remember correctly. Um, weather would have an effect. There's... Um, and then there's yellow fever, which also would also, um, there's some yellow fever checks that would be made. I think it's in this phase. Yeah. So we're not going to have yellow fever outbreaks either. You know, the scenario is just too, too short for that. So um, that weather phase basically is going to be ignored for this scenario. So the first thing we're going to do, and the U.S. player goes first, um, goes through these phases, and then the Spanish player uh, goes second, and then we'll go through the same phases. So we're going to start with the U.S. player. And so that the first thing we do is called the supply phase. And the, the U.S. player determines the supply status for his units and determine uh, which ones are out of supply. So, and I'm going to walk you through this, like I said, kind of carefully. I just want to give you a good overview of how the game plays. So, um, a unit needs to be in supply. And what that means for uh, either side, really, um, a, a combat unit is considered in supply if it can trace a line of supply um, of seven or hex, seven hexes or less to either a road or trail that leads to a valid supply source or be a leader that can trace a supply source seven hexes or less um, through a trail or road back to the supply source. Okay, so basically um, your units, you want your units to be um, really close to a road or a trail uh, seven hexes or less. And it's kind of hard not to be. I was looking at this map earlier. It's kind of hard not to be in supply, really, I think. Um, for instance, these, uh, right now the, um, the Rough Riders are on a trail. Actually, uh, so is the 1st Infantry Division. And so that trail, you can see, comes back to this road. And so the supply sources for the U.S., um, the supply source is here. It's this road leading off of this hex, uh, 0917. So this is considered the supplies coming in from this source. So you want to be able to trace back to that, um, that supply source and you know that means no enemy units blocking or uh, you basically clear clear path back to there so certainly these units can trace along this trail to this road 
all the way back to that supply source. So these units are in supply. Uh, these units, there's an artillery battery and uh, the observation balloon back here, they're in supply because the, you know, the road does trace back. For the Spanish player, uh, their supply source is any city hex, uh, any Santiago city hex. So um, they, they are, they're certainly in supply. Uh, you know, these roads all lead back, lead back to um, a city hex, and they're well within seven hexes of that. I don't think supply is going to be an issue in this scenario. Again, it's um, two turns, and all the movement that takes place in here, I think everybody's going to remain in supply, you know, unless a unit uh, somehow gets around another unit. I don't think there's time to do that, though. So the first thing we would do, again, is to um, check for supply. For the U.S., there's no issues here. So the second uh, phase is the command phase. And what that is, is each um, unit, with the exception of this observation balloon, it does not have to be, uh, you do not have to check for command, uh, the command uh, range here for the supply balloon. I do believe this artillery, I think you have to. Um, it's not clear to me in, in the rules that, you know, this artillery unit is way back here. I think it's got to be in command. So the first turn, though, you uh, ignore the command phase. So you basically have a turn to, I guess, get this artillery piece into command. Um, so, and to be in command, there are this General Kent unit, and I don't think there's one unit in the Grand Campaign that can that can command any any subunit. And, and they're not really subunit, but I guess... Um, the, their division, their, their grouping. So this, this commander Kent has a yellow band, and if you look, you can see that the uh, first infantry division has the yellow band. So he can command those units. He would not be able to command this cavalry unit because um, he does not have a blue band. But uh, General Wheeler and uh, Colonel Roosevelt here, that you can see they have the uh, blue band and the Rough Riders have the blue band, so they would command those units. Um, so what, what's the command range? It's this, um, it's probably hard to see. Let's see if I can show you. Um, it's that middle number, the four. So General Wheeler has a command um, range of four. And so those Rough Riders would have to be inside that range of four to be considered uh, in command. Uh, General Kent's the same. He's got a four, so you know they've got to be within four. So everything they're all certainly in command here. It doesn't like the first turn is not going to matter, but they are in command here. Observation balloon doesn't matter because it's not the command does not apply to that. Um, and if you look, there's a um, this observation balloon is right now. I've got it. It's considered, I guess, not deployed. There's a uh, this wagon has a movement range of five. It is on top of the observation balloon to show that it is um, not deployed. Um, so the artillery piece though, like I said, it's going to have to be in command the way I understand the rules and I could be wrong. Um, so for this first turn though, it's not going to matter. So we're all in command. Everything is good. And then we come down to the, uh, reinforcement phase. So, and that's just what it sounds like you're going to get, if you're due for reinforcements, this is where they would come in. And so for the U.S. side, it says reinforcements. These turn these units enter on turn one at El Pozo, which is basically um, here where the uh, artillery piece is. So this Gatling gun is going to come in, and it actually starts in this city. Now, I, I don't really understand. Um, it seems to me odd that in this scenario setup that this piece would come in as a reinforcement during turn one because... I mean, why not just deploy it initially? Like, why wouldn't that just be sitting there? And I don't really, I don't really understand um, why this reinforcement phase, um, turn one, you would add that. I, I, it could be just something with the scenario. Like I said, it just maybe, maybe they're just showing you the how, how you deploy or how you reinforce. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense here because the next phase is the movement phase, and the phase after that's the combat phase. So, whether he's sitting there or not, uh, this first turn. It's not going to change anything. So that's the reinforcement phase. This is all the reinforcements that the U.S. side will get. Um, because the scenario specifies, you know, turn one, that's what they get. Uh, so it goes there. Uh, that will take us to the movement phase. Okay, so the movement phase. Um, 
so for these leaders, you can see that, um, I get, I think you can see that it's, I'm also testing, <laughs> you, you're probably, um, viewers who've watched before know that this is my, uh, uh first attempt after the, the great camera, camera crash into <laughs> the battle of Lin, Lin uh, and uh, destroyed my map. So this is, um, that shouldn't happen again. Everything is secure. So this is this is my first test run of doing a uh, physical board run through again. It's also kind of, kind of why I wanted to do this quick little uh, run through of a Splendid Little War. Um, but so I'm, I'm I got the map is um, almost the entire thing here. You can see I've got Santiago Harbor over here, and you can see most of the most of the map is actually captured on camera. So that's good. That's kind of what I was testing. So I don't know if you can see um, these counters though just like that, maybe not, maybe so. But if you look, so general, um, it's that third number again. So general, get it to focus. General Wheeler has the 12 um, movement factor range. So you can move 12. Um, and the Rough Riders, let's see if we can do this. Those Rough Riders have a range of four, movement factor of four. And so we will move them now, zones of control do come into play here. Um, you can certainly move into a zone of control, but moving out um, can create problems under certain conditions, and we may or may not see that. So, um, movement, and I'll need the terrain chart here for this. Um, so, the reason I'm going I'm to move these forward for two reasons. One, like I said, time here is so critical. You two turns to do this, and I, I again, don't see how you can do it, but so time is critical. We've got to get these guys moving. And um, the other thing is line of sight here, um, the way I understand it, this is a hill, this is swamp. The way I understand it, these units do not have line of sight um, from here to the hill because of the swamp. Um, it, it says in the rules that swamp um, blocks line of sight. And again, to me, that's kind of odd because these guys are on a hill uh, it's kind of hard to imagine how this swamp would block line of sight from here to here, being that they're elevated. Um, and again, it may be just me misreading that rule uh, when they talk about line of sight. And let's look at it real quick, just to make sure I'm not going crazy, because I can certainly count the times I've gone crazy. So line of sight, where do we talk about line of sight? Um, and I guess it's not a very large rule book. It's actually, um, I think it's in the combat. Line of sight. So line of sight. In order for um, fire combat artillery spying to occur, there must be clear line of sight. So basically it's, they're telling you it's in the center of the hexes. Um, if the line of sight runs directly along a hex spine, separating blocking and non-blocking terrain, then it is not considered blocked. If on the same if on the same or higher level than either unit, the following hexes block line of sight and fire combat, jungle, swamp, village, and city. So it says on the same or higher, so that certainly applies here. Um, and so it, it applies to either unit. It tells me there's no line of sight um, for these units. So either way, I'm going to move them because, like I said, it's <laughs> time is running out. So basically, all I'm going to do is move... Uh, everybody forward. And so um, we're going to cross a uh, this creek. And so to cross the creek, it is um, this, uh, where did it go? It's a riverside hex, basically. So uh, it's two movement points to cross the riverside hex, and then to a uh, swamp movement is four. So let's see. And the other thing, too, is I should point out that, um, let's see where they go. So we know their movement rating is a four. And when we're looking at movement, it says that, um, Normal unit may only enter a hex if it has sufficient uh, movement factors to do so. However, any normal status unit may move a minimum of one hex. 
um, to hex that is free of enemy zone control if it expends all of its movement points to do so. Um, and so this doesn't apply to you know broken or added supply units. So to move, I'm going to move these guys forward. Um, certainly these leaders can do it because their movement factors are 12. Um, this cavalry, it's four, and like I said, it's two to cross the um, the riverside and plus four to get into that swamp hex. Um, but they can certainly use all their movement factors to to do this. Now, the other thing is they could also move, like I said, they're on a trail, so they could move here and then into here. So that's certainly allowable. So either way, this, this the Rough Riders are going to move forward um, with Roosevelt and Wheeler. And then we have Kent. See, their movement factors are four. Again, um, they can move... Um, they can move into here if they expend all of their movement factors to do so. Uh, and I'm also looking because this trail does run this way, so they could also come around this way. But I don't think they really gain anything by doing that. We're just going to move them forward. And so back to here, this Gatling gun, um, we want to get it up as fast as possible. It has a movement factor of six, and roads, it's half a movement point um, per road hex. So he has six. We can go one, two, three. Um, and then the trails are one. So it will be, let's do that again. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, and I think I'm going to just bring him up to here where it's five behind the Rough Riders. I'm hoping to catch up with the Rough Riders. So I'm going to move him there. That leaves the uh, the second artillery, um, and he can move six. Now I could leave the artillery piece back here. He he has a range of twelve, but um, that's you know maybe able to hit as far back as San Juan Hill, but I don't think that's going to do a heck of a lot of good. So I think what I want to do here is um, I think I'm going to bring him up to these hills. And that would certainly put him within range of all these other units. So again, he has movement factor or a movement rating of six. So it would be one, two, three, four, five. And that is not, yeah. So I'm going to bring him all the way up to um, here. Certainly he has the movement to do that. The observation balloon has a movement... Um, factor of five. So he can go one, two, three, four. And then I'm just going to bring him in that hex next to the um, artillery because when he's deployed, he can act as a spotter. That balloon can act as a spotter and basically cover that, that entire area. If I didn't have the balloon, I would need to have a leader or a unit that, um, acted, that could act as a spotter to be within range of the artillery and at the same time have line of sight to one of the units. Makes sense, right? So that's the movement phase. And then we come into the combat phase. And I will need the, uh, the handy dandy fire combat table for that. So let's get that out. And the rule book. And then we'll turn to the combat section here. So just make sure we're doing everything right. And so now the way this works is um, your units have to be um, in command and in supply. Otherwise, they cannot conduct offensive uh, combat fire. I could conduct... Um, I could actually do an assault here. Um, so I could instead... And I'm not going to. I'm just going to... I'm going to do um, fire combat from back here. We're just going to open fire. I could actually assault, though. And I don't want to do that because it's not... Um, it, it, <laughs> You know, typically there's a lot more risk involved in doing that. So I'm not going to do an assault here. So I am going to do fire combat. And um, all of these units are um, in supply, in command, so they can certainly do this. Uh, the other things you look for, let's see if I can slide this up. So we're looking for, are they broken? Is there weather? Are they in range? Um, and it says, you know, for range, non-artillery units can exert their full combat factor into an adjacent hex and half a combat factor up to two hexes away. But we're certainly adjacent, so they're going to get their full combat factors. 
Um, and then artillery is a little bit different. We'll get to that when we get to artillery. And they're in supply and they're in command. So um, we have this, let's see. Let's just let this sit here for a second. And actually, I can grab a um, marker so we can figure out which column we're on here. So basically, we're going we're gonna to figure out our um, total fire combat um, power. And we'll roll a d10. Uh, zeros are just that. They're zeros. They're not tens. And we will determine this number is um, how many um, step losses will be inflicted on the enemy. So we will start with... Um, and there's some there's some um, die roll modifications that we will make to this, and so let's start that. We'll just work our way through this. So take these two leaders off. So we have the rough riders have a combat factor of six. So um, and actually here I'm going to grab a because um, you will modify. Actually this number will change. So they're at six right now, um, and so we look at. Um, modifying, so there's some terrain modifications here which must be made, and we are, let's see, so we are firing there, uh, and, and I haven't said who's firing yet, but we're just going to fire straight ahead here, so the, these uh, Rough Riders are going to fire at this, um, this unit under, um, Commander uh, Ruben here, so... He, that's a hill, so they're going to get plus one uh, die roll modification because it's a hill. However, uh, all firing units stacked with an appropriate leader, and this is an appropriate leader. We have two leaders here, actually, and I don't think that the uh, leader factors stack, but there there are leaders there, so um, those are going to just kind of wash each other out. They get plus one um, uh, die roll modifier and minus one, so there'll be no modification based on terrain, um, uh, and this is just observation balloon stuff. So it's strictly, they're on the six column. Um, and then, let's see, I think that's it. I think that's accounting for everything. So we have, and before I, well, let's see, the, um, this artillery piece, I believe, and this is something else I wasn't clear about in the rules. I, was it wasn't clear to me if an artillery um, piece could fire by itself as an independent attack, or it had to be combined with a uh, fire combat with these forward units. Uh, not clear at all. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, I'm going to assume that that they the way the rules were written, it doesn't really say. It kind of talks though, or it kind of reads such that when there's a um, fire combat, if you want your artillery included in that, you would do so. So what I'm going to do here is say this artillery is going to barrage. Well, no, actually, I'm not. We're going to have this artillery piece join this attack. So we will leave this at six. So I'm not going to have this artillery piece fire yet. So anyway, uh, we're at six. We are firing at this stack uh, on the six column. I don't think there's any modifications I'm missing. Like I said, the die roll modifiers, plus one and minus one, they get washed. And we roll a d10. And um, we see what we get. And then we rolled a seven. I think that's showing up pretty good. Yep. So there's a seven. We look at the the uh, fire combat table, and a seven is a miss or a nothing. So that's not good. This is kind of how that the first time I ran through this went. I didn't hit anything that the initial round. And the uh, map is a little, it's a little warped here, so it's hard to move these things around. And so, okay, no effect there. So then we're going to have um, General Kent's 1st Infantry Division is going to fire at um, this artillery piece. And we're going to have this artillery piece barrage as well. So if we look, um, they are at six. So they're, they're starting at six. The artillery is going to join in. Its range is 12, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's not... Um, where did artillery go? Artillery units exert their full combat factor up to half their range. So we're well within 6 here. Uh, see, his, his range is 12. So 1, 2, 3, 4. It's only 4 away. So this is going to bring um, this 6 up to a 10. So... 
we are at 10. Still on this column, though, we needed one more. One more combat factor would have done it. Um, and you're probably thinking, why didn't you just charge the artillery? Like I said, we're, this is a learning thing. <laughs> just you're trying to get a feel for fire combat right now. So that's why I'm not charging the artillery. Um, and you could actually assume that uh, I could have set one of these guys up here on the artillery as well. In fact, let's let's say I did that. Um, well, no, let's just leave it as it. Well, no, let's do that. Let's say this guy was stacked with the artillery. Um, and then we'll move this trench. So these guys are trenched. I started these guys on San Juan Hill as uh, trenched. So let's say they uh, this guy was with the artillery to make it more realistic, I guess. So uh, anyway, they're at 10 now because the artillery is joining the bombardment. They're still on that 610 column, though, and um, we still have our leader. We still are firing. Uh, we're still firing up a hill, so it's a wash. It's just whatever they get when they roll. Um, I don't want to roll the yellow one. The black one's easier to see. So let's see what they get. They roll a, what is that? Looks like a one, which is pretty damn good. That's a that's two steps. So, and remember the Spanish, their units do not break down. Uh, so a step loss is a unit loss. And so, um, let's go back real quick and make sure that's right. Um, defender allocates the losses to his own units. Here, I don't think it's going to matter. It's going to be two-step losses, so that's basically going to wipe out um, both of these units. Which I can tell you did not happen the first time I played <laughs> through this scenario. Uh, not going to matter, though. I still don't see how the U.S. side could ever win this, this, um, this scenario if it's only two turns. I'm going to put these eliminated units off to the side here. I don't think it has a bearing on victory conditions, but we're just going to track it. And so now I believe, um, I don't know if, if these units can advance. Um, let's see. There, there, there was something about advancement in the rules after combat. Um... Maybe that's only assault combat. Advance after assault combat. So I'm thinking that maybe they can't advance if they just fire. Yeah, it says after advance after uh, assault combat, yes, but I don't see anything for firing. So it looks to me like these units cannot advance, even though they just wiped out both of those units. So, um, so everyone's fired. Um, that's going to be the end of the combat phase for the U.S. side. Um, and actually, I should have, um, during the movement phase, well, I, I guess I can't do that. I was going to say I should have deployed the balloon, but I don't think I can do that yet. The balloon, the, that's a special unit. And the, let's see, it has special units in here. Um, there's the engineers, and then here's the balloon. So I believe you have to spend one full turn, um, without moving. U.S. observation balloon can only be deployed during a movement phase of good weather turns. To do this, the base unit cannot move. So, yeah, he, we moved up there, so we can't deploy that yet. We can next turn, though. So that's it. We'll go to the add a supply morale check. Well, that, that's where if you had one of these, um, add a supply markers and there's two levels of add a supply so you'll go through one or two so if we had an add a supply marker on the unit we would have to do a morale check we don't so we're not gonna worry about that and then we go to the um well we don't go into the end phase yet we go now to the spanish side and so we do the exact same steps so we first look at supply um all units are supplied because like i said they have to be tracing supply back to santiago over here and they can certainly do that. Next phase is command phase. Um, and so for the Spanish units, it's a little different. Any Spanish leader, they don't, they're not restricted to the um, specific commanders for specific units. I believe that was correct. Um, 
there would be yeah they're talking about some secession here if uh leaders are eliminated and you can't have leaders uh, become eliminated through combat um so with the following exceptions all spanish commanders can command any non-naval spanish units um there are a couple here that are not in this scenario that are specific to their color coding and uh bustamante can only command naval units um I think I saw in the errata that's not true. I think it, the errata states that actually he can control. Well, he's the only one that can command naval units. That is true. But he can also control other um, uh, units if need be. So um, he's not even on the board yet, but uh, he will come out in the reinforcement phase. So, yeah, so they're in command. Everyone's in command. No problem there. So we get to the reinforcement phase. And for the Spanish, that would be... That would be, they get two guerrilla counters. That says these units enter on turn, oh no, that's turn two. Okay, they, <laughs> they do not get reinforcements this time. Uh, again, they come in in turn two, and I, I, it just seems too late to me, but okay, it is what it is. They will start in hex uh, 1513, it says, so um, that is back over here. Uh, so they'll actually show up here when they show up next turn. No reinforcements, so we go right into the movement phase. And I can tell you right now that the Spanish aren't going to move anybody. I, mean, you know, they, I guess we could consider moving... Because they're in a... These guys, we got um, General uh, Rubin and the this first PR um, are, are just sitting here alone looking at um, the Rough Riders coming at them and this first infantry division. So we could move... Up to range six, and I believe they're on a trail. I'm going to be careful because this map is like springy right here. They're not on a trail. Um, th this is a trail, so they could move. We could um, retreat them, and I think maybe we'll do that. So I think what they're going to do is retreat back to San Juan Hill. They can move six, so it's um, to move onto that hill space. It is three movement points to do so. So it would be three, um, and then it would be four, because they're on the road, um, five, six. So they can certainly get back to, well, they can't get all the way back to um, this hex is where I wanted them to go, unless they go. You know, they're also in a zone of control here. <laughs> So, hold on a second. So, I, I did say that matters, and it does. So, zone of control is the six hexes surrounding a combat unit. And so, right now, they have um, two U.S. forces in their zone of control. Um, so, non-guerrilla combat unit that enters an enemy zone of control must immediately end, so they're not entering. Uh, non-guerrilla combat unit that begins movement in an enemy zone of control may move out of the hex to one that is free of enemy zone of control but may then only continue moving, including entering another enemy enemy zone control, if it passes a morale check. So we could move out of this zone of control. So I could move him back, but then he would have to undergo a morale check, um, and then, which is dangerous, because I think this could break him if he fails it. If he does pass, he could continue moving. And let's see, it says if the unit occupies a jungle hex, while making a morale check, it receives a minus one uh, modifier, but that's not jungle, that's a hill. Uh, may not move from one zone, enemy zone of control to another enemy zone of control. So if I want to move these guys back, um, they're going to have to pass a morale check. Morale is fixed for um, each side, and it starts off... Let's see if I can find the uh, starting morale. I don't think for the scenarios there's anything specific. No, so we have to turn back to the, just the general morale. Um, there was a chart that shows you. I think the U.S. starts at 7, and I think the Spanish were at 5. 
Yeah, so U.S. morale rating starts at 7. Well, it is 7. It doesn't start there. Uh, Cuban at 4. Spanish is at 6. Uh, so these are these are uh, Spanish units. They would be at 6. So they have to pass a morale check at 6. It is 6 or less to pass. Um, otherwise, they'll, they'll become broken. And there are broken... If they were to become broken, there is a broken counter that would mark that. And if they're broken, it's not a good thing. Um, really here, they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't, because I, they don't really want to sit here with, with the Rough Riders coming up at them. So I think we're going to try it. I think we're going to... They're going to try to um, move back to that where that victory hex is on that hill. So... Um, for each unit required to make a morale check, roll 1d10. Uh, and there are some modifiers, it says. I Let's see. The only thing that I would think that would modify here, they're not in jungle. Um, and, of course, here it tells you, you know, if they're broken, uh, combat factor is reduced by 2. Uh, they get plus the 2 to their morale checks from then on. They only move by passing morale checks. Yeah, so it's, not, it's a bad thing if these guys become broken. Um, so leaders, I think, might be, let's see. So all units operating within command radius of the leader uh, from their formation apply a minus one die roll modifier to their morale check. So they would get a minus one here. Also says um, that having leaders um, will affect assault combat and fire combat, but we've already looked at that. So... All right, so they're going to, um, they do have a leader, so it's going to be a minus one. And they are going to try to retreat straight back. So they've got to get a six or less. Actually, a seven or less. So they do, they pass. So they're going to move back to here. And so that was one movement. Uh, no, that was, what did I say, hills were three? Yes, yeah, so that was three movement factors to move back. Um, and let's go back to the zone of controls. I thought there was something else. Because they did, in fact, um, move out of a zone of control. Um, zone of control. So, okay, begins movement. Um... May only continue moving um, if the unit passes the morale check. They did, so they, can, they certainly can, can continue moving here. So we can continue on. So it's three, uh, four. What would it be? Go to that swamp that I say. I think it's three. No, it's four to go to the swamp. So we definitely don't want to do that. I think we're down to three, right? Yeah, so we have three movement factors left. So we could go... Um, that trail does go that way. So we could go one, two, three. So you know what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bring him. I'm just gonna bring him back to let's bring this unit and the leader. I'm gonna bring him back to here for now. Alright, so they managed to pass their morale check and they moved back. Um, okay, so that was the movement phase, uh, combat. Well, we lost, the Spanish lost their artillery piece, so, um, that's the only, <laughs> only thing I think that could have fired, other than, um, the unit that, that used to occupy this X, but they're gone now, so there's no combat phase here. No one's out of supply, so there's no need to do a morale check for that, and that brings us to the end, well, we go through the end phase. That's the end of the Spanish turn is what I was going to say, right? So, the end phase, uh, the American player follows this sequence than the Spanish player. So, in the end phase, uh, we perform um, recovery checks for broken units. We don't have any. A uh, U.S. player would check for a balloon elimin elimination. Uh, it's not even deployed yet, not a factor. Um, we're not using automatic victory, no check for that. And if this is not the last turn, advance the turn. Marker one space. So this will move us into um, turn two. Now it's hard to see down here 
this turn track goes up to 28 for the full campaign. Um, and it's divided into AM, AM and PM turns. And I don't see any, um, at least in this scenario, I don't see where whether you're in AM or PM has any bearing on the game. Um, maybe it does in the, the grand campaign. I guess we'll find out. Um, so that's something to note. And so this brings us to turn two. And like I said, there's only two turns in this scenario. So you can already look at it and see that the U.S. side only has this one last turn to occupy and to grab uh, a majority of these green markers and so a majority is going to be four um or more uh so it looks like we might be able to grab one uh if we kind of want to stretch out this way maybe we can hit that one i don't know let's find out though so again supply phase we need to be within seven hexes of road or trail everybody's on a trail at this point or road and even if they're not they're, they have commanders that are so everything is still in supply back to this supply point so we're good there command phase um, everyone is now in command phase and command radius because this artillery piece was the only one that was out initially, but he's moved up. So people are in command. That's good. And now they go to reinforcements. Um, there are none for the U.S. player. He got his in turn one. This is turn two. No reinforcements. So we go to the movement phase. And so let's see. What do we want to do here? This Gatling gun can move six. Now we are on a trail here. And so I believe that these Rough Riders, let's see, it's a Gatling gun on a trail that comes around this way. So these Rough Riders can go, um, and the leaders I'm not so much worried about because they can move up to 12. Four, so they could go one, two, three, four. They can get to here. Um, we need to go through this hex, though, in order to flip it to uh, our side, to, uh, control to our side. And so, I mean, these guys could certainly do that while these um, Rough Riders come around this way and try to flank the Spanish. I don't think I can run... The, yeah, so the first infantry division has a movement factor of four. They'll never get, they certainly will never get this far at the end of turn two. I don't even think they can get this far. No, there's no way. I really think the only valid thing then to do is to have the Rough Riders come try to flank and have this, at least we can grab one of these uh, objective hexes before <laughs> the end of turn two. So that's what we're going to do. We'll have um, Rough Riders here can move four. And so there is a trail, so it's one movement factor. So it would be one, two, three, four. So that would bring the Rough Riders up to here. And of course, Colonel Roosevelt and General Wheeler are coming along with them. Now the Gatling gun needs to, I need to get that up here with these Rough Riders. Um, so it has a movement factor of six. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So perfect. They can do that. So now the Gatling gun is with the Rough Riders, which I believe historically was the case. So that's there. And now General Kent and his first infantry division. Let's see. Movement factor of four. So uh, to cross that riverside, it's two. The hill is an initial uh, three. So they can't do it this turn. There's no way. So I guess I was wrong about that. See, they're not on a trail, they're just in a swamp. So they can expend all of their movement. Well, let's see, why don't they go this way? So they're in a swamp, and to move into a swamp is three, did I say? No, it's four. <laughs> so it would cost um, all their movement factor to move. So yeah, it makes no sense. They might as well just move forward one. So they're going to do that. They're going to move up here. And that's going to take all their movement. Um, and then the artillery piece is not going to move, but we are going to deploy the balloon, the observation balloon. So to show that, we just take this wagon train and put it on the bottom, put the observation balloon on the top. It's clear weather. It took the whole movement turn to do that. So now our balloon is, the balloon has gone up. <laughs> so... 
Um, and what that means, like I said, now this artillery piece with its range 12 can hit anything really within range 12 without having to worry about any spotter units up here. All right, so that was the movement phase, and now we go to combat. So, um, and see, these, the Rough Riders could not have moved into this objective hex. This is as far as they could have gone. So, they are certainly going to attack this stack, and that's a hill. And the... Um, it's a road and a hill, so okay. And I just realized that I made a huge mistake um, when we had the attack down here with the artillery piece and the um, the other Spanish unit. So when you do a combat phase, I should have had there's defensive fire always happens first, and I, I didn't I forgot completely <laughs> forgot about defensive fire. Um, so basically, defensive fire would have been, and this is why I was so successful this time now that I think about it, and why the first scenario where I remember to do defensive fire wasn't so good. So defensive fire, they would have got a chance to fire first um, at the um, advancing American player. Uh, totally forgot, my fault, but that's okay. You'll see it here. Um, and like I said, this is why I was able to advance as far as I did, I'm pretty sure. So let's take a quick look here. We have, we still have our leaders. And now we have the Gatling then, so we are still at strength 6 plus that 4, or at 10. So, so far we are at 10. Um, there's no... I don't think we're going to lose... Are we at the terrain modifier? Um, so they are in a trench. That's going to certainly affect... Let's see. Make sure I said they were in trenches. I'm pretty sure they are. They are. There's a trench underneath there. So it's a hill. It's a trench. And even though we're on the same, we're on a hill, it's the same height. I still think we get the, um, the plus one because it's a hill modifier to that. Um, and plus one for entrenchment. But that'll come, that's added on to whatever our final combat factor is. So right now it's at 10 still. Don't think anything else is going to modify it. They're not broken. No weather. They're within range. They're in supply. So it's at 10. But first, like I said, these guys will get to do a uh, defensive fire round. And so their defensive fire round, let's do that first, which is what we should have done before. They're, they're at two. Let's get this. Let's hold this thought here for the uh, Rough Riders. So they're at two. Um, they do have a leader. And again, that's going to be a, that's going to be a uh, modifier when we actually roll. Um, they are firing at a hill, so I'm not sure that the terrain modification, it's bugging me that they're at the same hill level. I don't think that, um, I don't think it matters in this game, though. The terrain effects are hills. Each grouping of hills is considered a hill. For combat purposes, hills... Hill hexes between units on the same hill never block a line of sight. Each hill hex is considered individually for purposes of movement. Yep. Um, it doesn't say. It just says on the combat chart there's plus one because it's a hill. So I'm going to do it that way. Again, it's something else I need to ask about, I guess. So they're still at two. Um, they're going to fire at this stack. And this was the stack with Colonel Roosevelt and General Wheeler and the Rough Riders and the Gatling Gun, they are at two, and they will have a modifier of plus one for the hill, and minus one because they are with the leader, so it's just, it's at two. So they've got to get a, well, I don't want to use that one. I'm going to use this one because it's easier for you guys to see. So they got to get a one, two, or three to hit. And I've got to actually get this into the, and they do, they actually hit. So, well, this is good because, um, well, it's good in that you'll get to see that what happens when you take a hit. So, for the U.S. side, that is. So, they, they do take a hit. Um, there are leaders stacked in there. So, we're going to have to check for the leader loss, I believe. And um, let's see what it says. I 
thought there was a leader loss. There we go, leader loss. So anytime one or more step losses occur and a leader is present in the hex, immediately conduct a morale check to determine if each leader in the hex has become a casualty. Uh, use the same as per the unit. So again, for the US, it's seven. If the leader passes, there is no ill effect. If the leader fails, the unit is removed. Second D10 will then be rolled. And uh, we'll, he actually comes back. Now, it's not really, really going to matter here. So they're saying that if, you, if he fails, he comes out. But he comes back in so many turns later. Um, if leader, so if, if a leader does die here, there's some other things that are going to happen. So first, let's see if any leaders die. Um, we will start with General Wheeler. And we also have to check Roosevelt. So starting with Wheeler, he's got to roll a... He's got to roll a 7 or less. Well, he rolls a 9. <laughs> so that's not good. It looks like General Wheeler's going to die. Um... And here it says we would roll the second D10 to see when he comes back out. That's not going to be an issue here. So, uh, so Wheeler's coming out. Wow, that's bad. Um, uh, da, da, da. So if he's died, yeah, on the turn. So, okay, he's out. And now a leader dies if all the units switch here stacked with Wheeler. That's not true. So I was checking to see if the... The individual units, the Rough Riders, have to undergo a morale check, but it doesn't look like it. So, all right, let's check for Roosevelt. He's got to get a 7 or less. Um, the terrible Teddy dies. He's okay. He rolls a 5, so Theodore Roosevelt lives. So that was the defensive fire. And like I said, I should have done that back here, but oh well. Good thing I remembered now. So now Roosevelt's leading the Rough Riders and that Gatling gun, and they still get to fire. They were at 10. Um, so that's going to put them on this 10 column again. And they get plus one for the hill, but they get minus one because of the leader. But these units are in a trench, so it's plus one. So they're going to roll and see what they get. And it's a three, but we add one for the trenches. It's really four. Well, they do one step loss. So I think they only had... Um, so we've got, and I guess we did the same thing here, so there could be a leader loss here. And so we're going to check for leader loss here. Um, and the Spanish is at six. And they rolled a two, so no leader loss, but they do have to take a step loss. And I believe it's the, um, the owning player that chooses... Although, is it going to matter? Because if we lose, if we lose the um, the actual unit, then by default we lose the leader because it says a leader dies automatically if all the units in the stack are eliminated. <laughs> so, um, I'm guessing we can lose the leader then. The defender allocates the losses to his units. See, again, it's not really clear as to whether or not a leader is subject to being one of those choices. I'm going to say it is. I'm just going to say that they would just choose to lose the leader and keep the their regiment. And so that would be the end of... Um, the combat phase there, and again, I forgot. What I should have done also is have the artillery piece should have joined into that attack. So I should have actually, this 10 should have been um, the Gatling gun plus the 6 for the Rough Riders and plus 4. So that really would have put them on this column. It still would have been a 1, though, so it wouldn't really want to change anything. Um, but I did forget to do that, so it didn't matter. We'll say they did fire with the Rough Riders. So that is combat for the U.S. side. Um, out of supply, there is no one out of supply. And we go back over to the Spanish side. And for the Spanish side, everybody's in supply. Um, we go to command, everybody's in command. Um, and we go to reinforcements. So this is where the Spanish player gets 
um, two gorilla counters in hex 513. So we'll bring in two more gorilla counters in 513. I think that's, it's hard to see. It's getting dark in here. So this is 14, so 513 here. So they come in here, two gorilla counters. Now you'll notice, I don't know if you can notice this or not, it's kind of hard to see. I'll see if I can show you a little clearer here. These gorilla counters have a question mark for their uh, combat factor. And what'll happen is you have to roll to see what their combat factor ends up being in that particular combat. So that's kind of neat. Don't really know how they're gonna do um, until they actually get up to actually do something. So that's the two um, gorilla units. They get the naval company and uh, the naval leader Bustamante. So Bustamante. So they're coming in here too. That's their reinforcements. Let me go to the movement phase. So I am going to um I think we're gonna have. I think we're just going to let these guys sit here. I think we are going to move up um, Ruben. And I think we're going to move up. This unit's going to move up with Ruben. Now, there are, like I said, there are stacking limits, but we're in no danger of stacking issues here. There's so few units. I think the Spanish can have um, six or seven. So. <laughs> Not a big deal there. I'm going to bring up this unit. It's going to come up here to reinforce this stack that just took a pounding. I'm going to leave the gorillas there. And I'm going to move this unit. Um, just going to move them up to here. I'm going to leave, yeah, them. I'm going to leave this gorilla unit in the fort. And then so the naval units that are coming in. And move six, so one, oh, it's half a row, so it's one, two, three. I'm just going to bring them up to reinforce what's going on back here. Because like I said, really, we're at the end of the game, or the end of the scenario. We're at the end of turn two. There's not a whole lot more to do. These guys can move six. So I'm just going to move them up. Mm, we'll move, is that a valid move? They're not on a road, so it's, it's still one to move to here, though, because it's flat. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So yeah, I'm just gonna move these guys. We're gonna come up and help reinforce here. That's the movement phase, combat phase. So we are going to have, we will start with this stack and they're going to attack the Rough Riders. So again, before we do that, there is a defensive fire phase and we are gonna have um, they will defend against this stack. So they're at 10. Uh, I'm guessing the artillery can join in here. I don't know why it couldn't. So that, that would put us on the, um, this 14 column again. So they're firing. It's hill to hill still. They're, I, are they entrenched? No, I don't think they're entrenched. Let's see. No, they're not. I can't grab that. <laughs> they're not they're not entrenched so doesn't want to cooperate so no plus one for that so it's strictly going to be the uh, 14 fire defensive fire and they roll a four that is only a one so it's a one step loss for this stack of units and let's see who are they going to choose to eliminate Doesn't really matter because they're um, equal, so let's just grab one. We'll grab this one, see it's eliminated. And so now they have two combat factors firing at the Rough Riders, so they are at two. That's gonna put them over here. Uh, no modifications. These guys are also on a hill. Um, they do have their leader, so it's plus one, minus one again. So just they're at two. They got to get a one, two, or three to 
hurt the Rough Riders here. And a five is a miss. And so now we come to this stack. Oops. And I don't, I'm pretty sure they don't get to take defensive fire again. Let's double check. The unit does not need to be the target of offensive fires. Okay. However, the defending unit elects to fire. It has a choice of targets and must choose to fire to adjacent. So yeah, I did that. Um, I, it doesn't say again. See, I, the, the rule book. I really the rule book really needs to be cleaned up. I think, <laughs> and I hate to say that. I know this is the second printing, but it it doesn't say. Um, it's not clear to me. Defensive fire combat. Um, if you look at the combat sequence, defending units may perform defensive fire combat as well as defend against assault combat. Um, a single hex can be target of multiple offensive or defensive fire combat. So I guess they can. All right, I guess they can do it again then. I guess they can, they can fire again at this stack with their 14. So let's see what happens. Um, it's just a straight uh, 14 again. So they're gonna fire defensive fire first. They get a three, which is uh, one step loss. So who does that Spanish player wanna lose? Well, they were in a trench. Um, so there would have been a minus one. So it still hits at a, did I say a three? Bring them down to a four, but it still hits. So they're going to lose one of these units. They're both two six. So now we have, um, they're going to be back on the two for their, their fire combat. Um, they have a leader. They're firing at a hill though. So it's strictly whatever they get. Um, they got to get a one, two or three again. And they get a one, so they actually hit the Rough Rider. So again, we've got to do a um, morale check on Teddy to see if he survives. And he's looking for seven or less here. I don't think there's ever any modifiers for this. I think it's just a straight roll when you lose a leader. Uh, that is a zero, so that's fine. So Teddy lives. And now we have to take a, um, a one-step loss on the... U.S. forces. So now what I could do here is I could either take the Gatling gun and remove it, or I can break the Rough Riders down into their subunits and take a loss. And that's what I'm going to do. So the um, this marker would come out, and then I would have put in the three Rough Rider units that make up that single unit of cavalry. And now I, I, I must uh, remove one of these to take that step loss. So we're going to take the weaker one, a combat factor of one, and eliminate it. And so now we've lost two. We can lose five, I think it was, right? So that's the loss on the U.S. side. Um, and so... Um, as far as I uh, said earlier, line of sight. I don't think these other units can fire. I don't think they have line of sight. Let's see. Well, let's just... So these, this fired. This one fired. Um, yeah, friendly or enemy units block line of sight. So they can't fire anyway. So that's the combat phase. Then we go to the out of supply morale check phase, end phase. Pretty much that's the end of turn two. And so I think you can see what I'm talking about here. And so my problem with this scenario is two turns is not long enough uh, to play this scenario. If you, if you wanted to play it to the end, um, I think even if you rolled everything perfectly at, for the U.S., uh, I still don't think you could win. I just, I don't see it. And I, I maybe it's something I'm doing wrong. And I, I, I plan on asking on Board Game Geek. Uh, if somebody knows, please leave a comment below. Um, to me, this this ought to go on more than two turns. I think uh, ultimately, um, 
the U.S. stands a good chance of winning if it, if it continued. I don't know, though. It's hard to say. Um, I took quite a pounding here, and that's with forgetting to take defensive fire here. Um, but I think I think uh, I've accomplished what I want to accomplish here, and that's to show you, you know, the mechanics and how it plays and, the, and how it plays out. And I do I do believe that the meat of this game is in the is in the grand campaign where you play all twenty eight turns. You have weather. You have yellow fever taking place. Um, I think if you played the full campaign, it would be a much closer, uh, much closer game between. Uh, I don't think the U.S. could just come in and, and just take out the Spanish easily. I think it would be, I think it would be a very close game. And I certainly at some point want to get back and play this one all the way through. Um, so yeah, there you go. I just wanted to show the mechanics behind it, and some of the issues I've encountered with it. And like I said, I really, these these first three scenarios, I, I just think they're broken, honestly. Um, I, I didn't play the first scenario. Again, though, if you look in the rule book at the first scenario, it's, it's just like this one. It's um, turns one through two. And so as you can see, there's two turns. is not a lot of time to do anything. Um, so... Um, and of course that third scenario tells you to play turns one through three where you're actually basically you're just playing San Juan Hill again and you're playing the first scenario but you're playing it both of them for three turns and now had I gone on had I gone on to a turn three here and played through it I feel like maybe I could have chipped away a little bit more I don't know it's still I don't think three turns even would be enough to play out this scenario um so there you go anyway um uh, I like the game. I like some of the mechanics. Um, I, I do look forward to trying the full campaign to see how this plays out. Uh, it's a nice looking map, nice components. I, I would recommend this game um, based on just what I've you know read and what I the, the way it plays. Um, I do think it's a good game. I think there's a good game in here. I just think that these these introductory scenarios are broken. I don't think. Um, they are good for teaching mechanics and showing the mechanics of the game. But as far as, you know, if you just want to jump in and play the San Juan Hill, I think you're going to have to modify it. You're going to have to house rule some things. I think you're going to need to increase the turn um, chart. Uh, maybe play around some of these victory conditions, losing U.S. units. I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, other than that, I think there probably is a very good game here in the campaign. And whether we get this to the table in a future episode of My Own Worst Enemy, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we will. Um, but I thank you for uh, sticking with me if you watch this. And as always, please come back to see what's in store next time.